so welcome or uh, welcome back to those who were with us yesterday to the second day of the philosophy disability and social change conference uh, the third in the series in the sequence uh, my name is jonathan wolf joe wolf um, i'm a professor at the blavatnik school of government that is sponsoring this event uh, which is co-organized with shelley tremaine um, i'm a white man i'm wearing glasses i have gray swept back hair wearing warm winter black cardigan um, i'm sitting in a fairly plain room with uh, a blind half drawn and some plants behind me so in this first um, five minutes before we get started we we have a uh, suggested that we are um, introducing an informal meet and greet which is not so easy to do in this webinar format so what we would encourage you to do if you'd like to do this is just to say hello in the chat uh, maybe to just put your name in uh, which where you're from and perhaps say a little bit about your interest in issues around disability so um, you can if you go to the bottom you'll see the chat and you can put your messages in there you would want to send it to everyone and uh, just to introduce yourself uh, no obligation to do that and we will start the first session uh, at the appointed time which is in in three minutes time while um you're composing your message if you are doing that um let me just say a little bit about organization so we have a, a live transcript if you go to the bottom of your screen there's a cc button and if you press cc uh, you can pick show subtitles and you also have the option there to uh, adjust the size of it so you can uh, make the text bigger or smaller if you wish and if you get bored with it you can hide and you can put up a full uh, transcript so Shelley has tried to get the chat going a bit by welcoming everyone. Um, I think people are a little bit shy to introduce themselves, or maybe the tech isn't working quite right. But uh, anyway, what, whatever it is, we're not there very much yet on the chat. Um, so in addition to the live transcript, uh, when it comes to asking questions, you'll see along the bottom of the screen there's also um the q a and if you have questions if you can type your question into the q a uh, we will then read it out in the first session will as chair will read it out and um will be answered in turn there is a feature on the q a that allows you to upvote questions so if there's a question if there's the question you would have asked or a question you like the look of a lot you can sort of raise a thumb and that will push the question nearer to the top okay so we ha have welcoming messages from will and uh Maita, if sorry Maita, if i mispronounced your name there um and i think we will be ready to go any moment so let me um turn off my microphone and video and pass you over to will who's going to introduce the first session today thank you hello everyone um my name is will conway my pronouns are he him i'm a white man in a black shirt and a blue blazer with parted brown hair and a blurred background uh, welcome to the first presentation of the second day of the third disability and social change. This morning we have some, well, depending on where you are, I guess, for, for me it's morning. We have some very special uh, presentations today, but I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Elena Gautier Mamariel. Her work focuses primarily on disability, the philosophy of Spinoza, uh, decision making surrounding healthcare policy, patient doctor relationships. But today, uh, she is presenting on social, the socially inadequate 
COVID long haulers and uh, eugenic social engineering. So just a few things that have pretty much already been covered by Jonathan. If you could put your questions in the Q&A, it's wonderful that we have a panel here and we will certainly ask questions, but it's obviously preferable if there's a plurality of voices. Of course, all the panelists know, but I'll just reiterate uh, to keep uh, speech as slow as possible, both for everyone to be able to, you know, keep up, but also for uh, for the uh, captioning system. I'm a recovering policy debater, so <laughs> I struggle with with speech, uh, with uh, speed in speech. Um, so yeah, without further ado, thank you all for being here, and I'm going to hand it over to Alana. Thank you very much, Will, and thank you for Shelley and Jonathan for inviting me. This is my second philosophy, disability, and social change conference, and I enjoyed it tremendously last year, so thank you for having me back. Um, you see me now as a light-skinned Filipinx woman with short, curly, dark hair, and I have a blurred background, kind of white walls and dark wood doors. Uh, behind me. So without further ado, I will share my screen. So today I'm joining you as part of the Center for Biomedicine, Self and Society, which is an interdisciplinary research center more or less around medical humanities and social science humanities at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And through that work, I have been continuing my research on relational autonomy in healthcare and non-Western, it's specifically Filipino philosophy, understandings of ontological relationality as applied to healthcare. And I'm pursuing research about long COVID and how people with long COVID or long haulers, as I will mention throughout, are being treated and how the healthcare systems in the world, but specifically in the UK, are dealing with this new generation of either newly disabled people or more disabled people. So people who are already disabled, who now have additional symptoms that may affect the ways in which they are disabled throughout. So I titled this talk, The Socially Inadequate, because my research has taken me to look at the history of eugenics in the UK. And this is a paper that came out, um, I believe in 1922, and titled The Socially Inadequate, or How Should We Categorize, How to Find Them, Identify, and Categorize Them. So basically all of the unwanted uh, parts of society and why specific people, either because they are poor, because they are literate, because they are physically disabled, because they have a mental or cognitive disability are deemed to be socially inadequate. And my thinking was that this is something that we are seeing with people who are affected with long COVID and no longer can continue life as they were before. And as we move out of crisis mode in the West, at least the lack of access that has resulted from dropping sanctions and mask mandates and all of these things means that if anyone is disabled as a result of the pandemic, not to mention all the people who already were disabled, are having to deal with new waves of segregation and of being deemed socially inadequate. So I will be exploring that today. However, You will see that I will not be speaking on long COVID specifically. And my main reason for this is that this is still an ongoing situation. We have some data as of July of this year, the WHO, so the World Health Organization, 
had counted about 17 million in Europe alone with symptoms of long COVID. In October, I believe, in Scotland, there were more people with long COVID than the population of Aberdeen, the city where I live. And so there's still, we need more empirical data on how that's going and how different people are interacting with healthcare systems. So today I'm not going to focus on that. Rather, I'm going to frame this as an opportunity, as a way of looking to our past and understanding how we frame who we deem to be socially inadequate or socially adequate. And for to do this, I will be using the figure of the zombie. So this is my outline. I'll go through a brief introduction. I'll give you us the problem uh, of the zombie deja vu, why I'm using zombies, the idea of hauntings, of eugenic reconstruction narratives, and then discussing zombies a bit more in detail and how I plan to undertake this. This is very much a work in progress of me developing this concept of how I want to use zombies. And I am by no means at this point an exhaustive expert on all the different kinds of zombies. So I welcome all your questions and comments about that. Finally, I will lead to this idea of zombortunities. So I couldn't resist a portmanteau. And this idea of how should we deal with this as a philosophical framework, I will be arguing that we should explore pararationality and how the figure of the zombie can help us kind of deal with this not unprecedented situation because societies have recovered from social traumas before, as we will see, but still something that is unfolding. So how would exploring pararationality help us deal with this situation? So I'm going to present a broad research question. This is intentionally very large in scope, and I intend to refine it over the next few years. But I'm going to be presenting this idea that we need to deal with mass disablement. We need to understand what mass disablement means. Mass disablement is a term that comes up in disability justice circles or disability communities more broadly, but is not seeing much uptake within bioethics or within the policy side of healthcare. So I kind of want to explore what would it mean if we asked ourselves, how as a society do we deal with mass disablement? And this will mean that we should engage with what I call prophetic disabled epistemologies. So this idea that there is untapped and sometimes willfully ignored pools and libraries, uh, embodied libraries of knowledge within disabled communities around the world that have much to teach us about what it means to rethink care, healthcare, mutual aid in moments of great uncertainty and moments of great stress. And finally, this idea that we can use zombies as an analytical concept that is useful to think about long haulers specifically in this time and place. And here we have a picture of the Gloucester zombie walk from 2019. We have some people dressed up in pseudo Victorian slash pirate wear with fake blood makeup and kind of prosthetics. And, and in the backgrounds, the UK um, attendees might recognize O'Greg's. <laughs> so this is my research question. How do we reckon with mass disablement in healthcare? I posit that we are dealing with a new generation of the socially inadequate. Now, I know there is much contention about the attention that is being paid to long COVID and long haulers, and that has elicited very complex feelings within disability communities, specifically communities I'm a part of, like MECFS, 
where we see a lot of overlapping symptoms and we have the knowledge that our demands have not been met for decades and generations of people at this point. And so there is a bit of bitterness that comes along with all the attention that long COVID is happening, having. However, I do think that this is an opportunity to not set long COVID aside as something special and magical, but as something that is integrated and comes within a history of disability, disability communities, disability knowledge. So how would we frame the question of how do we deal with people with long COVID as a way of how do we reckon with mass disablement in healthcare? And I'm taking my cues from Alice Wong and Leah Lakshmi, Leah Lakshmi Pietsna Samarasinha with this idea that, you know, we are looking at more mass disablements with global warming, with different wars that are going on. We are seeing this idea of mass disablement and possibly more pandemics in the near future. So thinking about this, yes, I'm focusing on long COVID, but it is something that is helpful to look at more broadly. So zombie deja vu. This idea is that we as societies, and now I'll be speaking mostly of UK and like bridging with the US and Canada a little bit, this idea that we have as societies gone through periods of reconstruction after social trauma. I'm specifically looking at the aftermath of the First World War and the Spanish flu. And in the UK, that also marks a shift towards the beginning of the Department of Health. Previously, there were other kinds of public health measures, but the Depart the Ministry of Health is created in uh, 1919. And this is what will kind of keep going until the NHS is started in 1948. So this is a period of people who are mourning the loss of their loved ones as casualties of war, but also the immense upheaval that happened when we have to reorganize society in times of war and then reorganize society to face a pandemic. And the thing is, the eugenics movement was very present at that time and was actively petitioning parliament. And we are seeing eugenic ideology being pushed paired with specifically ideas of fiscal reform. So this idea of instigating on one hand in the public health construction, when we're rethinking what public health looks like in Britain, and this idea of how do we rebuild economically after this social trauma that is war and pandemic. And Basically, from what we're seeing in the disability communities now, there are canaries in the coal mine. There are alarm bells saying, you know, we're facing austerity. We're facing lots of different opportunities for healthcare services to be shut down, to be privatized. And history is telling us that this will engender eugenic practices and people within the disability communities are already pointing out that throughout the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen eugenic uh, decisions being made, not only through triage, but through social uh, practices. And right now when able-bodied people want to go back to normal, this is a narrative that is pushed by governments and there is prioritization of economic health. Um, so as I said at the beginning, our situation is still unfolding. However, there are enough red flags for me to go back and see how we have dealt with this idea that eugenics is still haunting us. And now I'm thinking about the zombie specifically because First of all, in our kind of Western complicated 
idea of the zombie, we are now used to a horde of zombie. I'm aware that that is not the origin of the zombie in Caribbean culture, and maybe we can discuss that in the question period. But this idea of the zombie horde is something that I think is a very powerful image of this idea of mass disablement and this idea that we are living with people who we know who are our loved ones and our co-workers and our neighbors, but they are radically transformed in a way that now makes it difficult to think about sociability and our civil responsibilities. I'll briefly touch on this distinction between eugenics and neogenics. So when I tell people I'm looking at eugenics, sometimes I get the response, this is a historical movement that is no longer relevant. Yes, there was a eugenic education society, there were international congresses, but that was kind of a fringe movement that is discreet and closed into the past. Now, is this partially correct? Sure. There aren't really a lot of think tanks that are like eugenic think tanks that name themselves as such. And it would be completely out of line for any public health initiative to use the word eugenics in their reports, in their publicly available materials, any of that. So the word eugenics has fallen out of favor and definitely since the atrocities uh, committed by the Nazis were made public, the term has not had the same kind of validation that it had, say, at the turn of the 20th century or even in the 1920s, as uh, I have been researching. However, disabled people are still using the term and are still pointing out ways in which policies whether in healthcare or in economics, are being used to effectively either prevent disabled people from being born or prevent disabled people from reproducing or prevent disabled people from living a fulfilling life. Now, some people will say that this, we should call this eugenics to differentiate that from the historical moment if you will, of uh, eugenics ideology and eugenic science. And they will argue that the current eugenics is not only concerned with reproduction, and by this I mean sexual reproduction, but looks at policies that affect disabled people. And to this I say, this is kind of splitting hairs. The original eugenics movement was very much involved in policy as I outlined previously. And I reserve the right to change my mind about this or to be convinced otherwise, but I think it is still useful to use the term eugenics now because it forces us to reckon with the fact that what we think is neatly tucked away in the past is still very much present, even though we have new technologies, even though rights movements have advanced, et cetera, the fundamental problems about determining who is socially inadequate and how people feel they have a public responsibility, sometimes a moral responsibility to eliminate or segregate the socially inadequate is very much present. And this idea that we have a long history of living with uncertainty and that we should lean into that and learn about that. So I see eugenics as very much trying to exert control and the knowledge and the wisdom from disability communities, um, I view as a long practice of living with uncertainty that can be the antidote to this. So the idea of eugenic hauntings, we have here two images. Uh, one of them is for the, it was a poster for the, Third International Congress of Eugenics. It is a drawing of a tree that's called eugenics. We have the legend eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. And we see various roots that all have names of academic disciplines on them. So we have things 
the right, for example, that we might expect, like medicine, surgery, psychiatry, sociology, genetics obviously is in bold, but we also they have things like archaeology, history, statistics, politics, law, economics. So I take this to be a fairly clear indication as well that the eugenics movement, as we think about it, was much more than just deciding who should reproduce and should not reproduce. It was thought of as an intersectional, um, interdisciplinary kind of moral project. And the same second image is actually from the U.S. And this is uh, what we would call maybe, you know, we would find these ads on Instagram now, but now they're just on a placard. And in the middle, it says some people are born to be a burden and various uh, little notes around it explaining statistics about people who um, are socially inadequate. So this idea of eugenic hauntings. So I mentioned briefly before this idea that as people are thinking about, and by people, I mean academics, uh, politicians, doctors, when we look at the roster of the education, uh, the eugenics education society. We have people from lots of different professions being part of it. Definitely some medical doctors, but also journalists and anthropologists and philosophers. So this idea that once we have the opportunity to reconstruct, to rebuild after a social trauma, this is when eugenic efforts manifest themselves. Uh, in the US and Canada, we'll see sterilization laws passed. Uh, the UK never passed the law. However, those were definitely proposed in parliament and were debated. Uh, this idea that, okay, now that we have lost sons in the war, we need to recompense the families that have served the state and we must devalue people who are unable to serve the state. And as I said, this is a turning point in the UK where the Ministry of Health is being born, the major change after the poor law passed at the end of the 19th century. And in the documentation, it is clear that the idea, the scope of public health is to encompass what is called the independent sick. So this is the idea of people who are able to recover, people who have had the misfortune to become sick, but were prior good citizens or part of a productive class of society, whilst the chronically, the chronic paupers or people who are sick because of their living conditions and of living in poverty are not to be included within public health institutions. So we see very clearly um, I'm, I don't know if it's a shift because probably these ideas were around before, but this is a decision as the a new department of health is being created saying, you know, public health, it was looking at sewage and water and all of these things. Um, and eugenicists really want to push for a turn towards the individual and the idea of people who are deserving or people who are able, once we treat them, to quote unquote, support themselves and walk on their own two feet. So people who will need more and longer um, care should not be within the remit of public health institutions. And so how does this fit in with the idea of the zombie? So I see the zombies as those who survive the apocalypse the wrong way. So they've had the audacity to not die, um, but now they have they have different bodily needs, mental needs. They may not be able to communicate with the people around them. And they also represent this idea of decay, of being near death that freaks everyone out freaks all the able-bodied people out, and this idea of the figure of the zombie as a mythological creature that does not represent wisdom, or we believe we do not have anything to learn from them. And this is kind of where I want to 
twist this idea of the zombie by saying you know disabled people have a tremendous amount of knowledge and wisdom but there is this epistemic occlusion that is happening where there that knowledge cannot or will not be shared for a variety of reasons so i also like the idea of the zombie because of the idea of recoverability I just mentioned. So when we're looking at zombie literature, zombie filmography, there are usually two moral options, either kill the zombie or cure the zombie. In some versions, they institutionalize zombies, but again, that is a form of like segregation. So the zombies are allowed to live together, but they're not allowed to interact with humans. And so I think that we should track as I live in the UK and I study the UK, you know, the NHS has been defunded for over a decade now. We are in a period of austerity. Uh, one can only expect very astringent measures being taken with healthcare. And I will be very curious to see um, what aspects of recoverability will be enforced. We already see people who are like, when will I recover from long COVID? Now, some people do recover. Some people don't, or some people will in a long time, but this idea that a biomedical approach will be the solution to long COVID is very much a narrative that is being pushed. And I'm saying, as someone part of MECFS community, this is something that we need to present as one narrative and not the whole narrative. So looking at how we shape policy, how we push this idea of reconstruction by valorizing recoverability should be mitigated by presenting other narratives as well. So the idea of zombies, so I've mentioned already a little bit the near death aspect. So we have a lot of people who are reporting immense grief about not being able to pursue life as they were before becoming sick with COVID. People who used to run marathons are now bedridden. All of this idea of feeling like so much was taken away from them and their possible futures are taken away. So individually people are dealing with a lot of grief, but also societally this idea of a devitalization, which by the way, the devitalized is one of the classes of the <laughs> socially inadequate. Um, and I thought that zombies worked quite well with this. So this idea of being really near death and not being able to hide that. Obviously there are varying levels of severity uh, of symptoms, but in general, I'm looking at this idea of people no longer being able to continue as before. And this idea of being near death and how that can be terrifying and how that can also be catastrophized by a society that is so focused on recovery. And then I look at alt-life because zombies are the undead. They are not... So that's it. They have the audacity to not completely die. They are continuing, but in a transformed state. And this is where this idea of wisdom of disabled communities comes in. This idea that life is no longer normal, no longer fits within the parameters of a capitalist, ableist society, but it is still life. And I think this is where we need to explore that to some degree. Um, the idea of class is very much present in eugenics, specifically uh, in the UK. You know, I mean, we can discuss this, like race and imperialism definitely have a huge part, but it is very much spearheaded as how do we make the middle class thrive? How do we get rid of the inbred aristocracy? And how do we get rid of basically everyone living, living in East London, all the unredeemable poor. Um, so this idea of eugenics linked with disability is extremely linked with class and this idea of which class is deserving and which class is not. And the idea of being born in a specific class or having specific sicknesses because you're poor. I've discussed kind of overall this idea of linking zombies with disability, uh, having various different needs the zombie body and the zombie mind have, even zombie language. 
uh, might be very much transformed by zombification and race and colonialism. So I won't speak on this too much at this point, but the figure of the zombie comes from Martinique and Haiti and the Caribbean in general and has a sp space within voodoo culture and religion that I still need to educate myself on. But very much the idea of the zombie we have now is a colonialized a colonial version of the zombie where the zombie is featured as the black body that we are afraid of represents uh, how we other people um and has also been used within kind of global north forces like the americans use the figure of the zombies to try and sabotage the german assets in haiti right before the first world war um so this idea of using zombies as a way of othering, as a way of showcasing uh, fear, primal fear, and this idea of the destruction of civilization is very much the case. And I do think that that will be very interesting to look into. And um, right, I'm doing right now, though, is looking at how we can think about this transition, this reconstruction period um, in an anti-eugenic way by looking at thought and philosophy that uh, resists certain colonial narratives. So this is where pararationality comes in. So I define pararationality as something that is distinct from irrationality. So this idea that whatever breaking the binary of this idea of like either it's rational or it's irrational. And in Western philosophy, this usually means um, anything that is effective, that is linked to the imagination will not be rational. And I take this term through a Derridian reading of Kant with Spinoza with feminist theory. So feel free to ask me questions about that later. But it's this idea that when we interact with the world, there is an aspect that surrounds rationality that is distinct from it, and yet ushers us into the rational presence or can help us understand rationally or can hinder. So it's a kind of ambivalent ally this idea of para as in paramedical as in beside with so this idea that how we think about agency and autonomy and what's important with rationality is presented in a way that precludes different understandings of what agency means. And I've worked on relationality very much so, and I worked on feminist relational theory and this idea that we should not have a Cartesian ideal of an independent, solipsistic, atomistic person as our ideal of agency. However, I have found that there are limitations within Western feminist philosophy that still grapples with this Cartesian dualism. And I have turned to ontological relationality in Filipino philosophy. You can refer to my talk for this conference last year, but also in my forthcoming chapter in the book um, edited by Shelley. I'm talking about this idea of using Filipino thought as a way to sidestep certain complications that come with believing that our only worthy adversary or concept to be debated is Cartesian dualism and the mind-body separation. And so this idea of looking outside of kind of a colonial mentality to look at relationality is something that I think we should explore as we're moving through this liminal space of trying to understand 
how we deal with mass disablement and this idea of how do we redefine what it means to be agentic whilst being fundamentally codependent, fundamentally interdependent. What does it mean to rethink agency if we reject the idea that we are only valuable or only adequate if we perform a specific version, restrictive version of rationality, and which is fed into this idea of productive rationality. So basically I'm saying, I'm looking at history, like, okay, this is the push, a, a push where we devalue people who are unable to be independent. And now as we are living through our own liminal moment, how can we look to Filipino philosophy and other philosophies, including indigenous philosophies, to try and understand different ontological formations and pair that with the lived experience and wisdom and sometimes oral history of epistemologies and this idea that disabled people have been thinking, living, and practicing different expressions of care, of mutual aid, of solidarity in a way that mainstream society has not been exposed to or listened to. And so this is kind of this idea of looking at and listening to what is available to us within disabled communities. And because I'm a philosopher, <laughs> looking at ontological possibilities within Filipino philosophy. So in conclusion, I propose that we should exercise our hauntings, that we should accept that we are living a eugenic legacy and stop putting that in the past, and that we are experiencing global mass disablement with more likely to come, that we have reached the limits of healthcare policies based on individualistic autonomy, and that even Western feminist relational theories are still beholden to a certain limited conceptual context. And this includes Marxist feminists. I realize these are fighting words, but bring it on. So our once and future zombies, this idea that I believe moving forward, I propose that we explore the pararational aspects of agency, collective thinking, and crip solidarity. We need to be collecting, analyzing, and engaging with the and anti-colonial epistemologies and really centering that and asking traditional narratives and structures to justify themselves rather than the other way around. So really starting with um, anti-colonial epistemologies. And I look forward to developing the figure of the zombie as the crossroads between disability, sociability, pararationality, race, and colonial studies. Thank you very much. And you can reach me here. I have a website, uh, Twitter, a Mastodon now, and feel free to listen to my podcast, Philosophy Casting Call. Thank you. Thank you. That was that was wonderful. So we're going to move into a brief Q&A section. So at the bottom of your webinar platform, there should be, uh, there is a Q&A button. And if you could just start placing those there, I will start reading them. So our first question comes from uh, Amandine uh, Katala. She writes, thank you very much uh, for your really interesting talk. A comment, then a question. My comment is that the question of eugenics versus eugenics reminds me of Charles Mill's claim that the racial contract, uh, that the racial contract is ever present just under different forms across different eras and places. It seems that the same applies uh, for eugenics. See, for example, spec the Spectrum 10K project that aims to map the autistic genome in order to cure autism and, uh, uh, and do parental testing in the same way that it's done with Down syndrome. My question is that if zombies are creatures that persist and refuse to die, could eugenics slash neugenics be a sort of zombie, or is it too much alive and too well qualified, uh, and uh, too much alive to qualify well as a zombie? 
I would say eugenics is more like a virus <laughs> in that sense. I guess it could be a zombie. Um, I think we could say that. I'm not particularly interested in saying that, possibly also because the idea is that eugenics is still a very much a palatable concept to people, even though the term has fallen out of favor, this idea like people think, of course, disabled people don't value the quality of their life. Of course, you know, you know, even I see on Twitter people encouraging long haulers who are talking about their symptoms or like, you know, they're expressing suicidal ideation and people are like oh yeah you don't want to be a burden like of course like it's very much a part of how we are primed and taught to experience the world and so I would say it's not a zombie because of the kind of visceral abject nature of the zombie people are like oh that's gross um I think unfortunately people are way too comfortable with zombies so maybe they're more like vampires where they're like yeah you're a blood-sucking creature but you're so noble and you have all these elitist thoughts about humanity all right we have another question for this is from owen uh fantastic talk and i can't wait to see your piece on this when it comes out uh i think you might have uh been implying this and if so, uh, could you expand on it a bit here if time allows? But are you drawing on any of the work that's being done around haunting, hauntology, et cetera, within Black studies? Avery Gordon, Dion Brand, Tao Ho, Tiffany uh, Lithabo, uh, King, uh, Christina Sharp, and others, uh, as well as Indigenous and decolonial texts such as Tuck and Rees, uh 2013 uh, Glossary of Haunting? Well, thank you, Owen. Um... I had heard of some of these names, so not all, so I'll definitely be taking note. But yes, I am delving into hauntology. So it's still very new to me uh, at this moment, but I will definitely be engaging with that. Go ahead, Jonathan. So fabulous talk, and um, it's way, way out of my sort of cultural references, I, I think, to be thinking and talking about zombies because I'm, I'm not a great follower of science fiction um but I, I think it's a fantastic image because you know the zombie is someone who's depicted sort of paradoxically both as weak and powerful um and uh an object of fear and but but I I don't know many zombie movies I, I don't go uh, I don't make a point of watching them but my impression is that things don't tend to work out terribly well for the zombies in the end typically um and and so what what I, i'm wondering I, so I i see this as a sort of dystopian description of reality um what i am not seeing yet is where it leads us so do, does it take us in this purely negative and critical way I, and now that's a fine project i'm not objecting to it but but I, i'm thinking in terms of you know the third part of this conference on social change where do we go do we need a new model of public health do we need a way of de-zombifying the zombie population do we give the zombie population power what do we do I, and if that's an unfair question just tell me no that's absolutely fair and yes it is kind of bleak and when we look at zombie literature writ broadly, it's kind of no one wins in the end. Like even the humans die, it's not like a, a wonderful utopic thing. But I guess the negative aspect is, well, if we keep going as we are, as we are haunted by these eugenic practices and ideologies, then yes, probably it will end badly for the zombies and for everyone. But what I'm proposing is, okay, we have um, an untapped source of knowledge, which is the knowledge of disabled people uh, who have not been listened to, who have been, whose testimony has not been accepted, in part because sometimes it does not fit, fit within bounds of rational capacity or what in um, 
medical legal speak is called insight or this idea of like if you don't describe your condition within very specific biomedical ways then you don't know what you're talking about etc um and what we're seeing now is a push to make the patient expert but this even this idea of expertise is very problematic so i'm saying we should look at how do we listen to the people who have lived through this who have inherited all this knowledge and created this knowledge and look at specifically and purposefully different ideas of agency. So it no longer becomes, how do we cure the zombie to make them fit back? It's it, how do we deal with, now we, our friends, our family, our wife, our like best friend or zombies. Um, so this idea of also of zombies is that they're not aliens. They are people that are, were among us and we have a memory of relationships with them but now we are faced with how do we change that how do we do that so it's also it's an ethical question but also a political question of what do we mean by civility and what do we mean by society um and so i hopefully there is some hope uh, but i'm saying we definitely need to change the ingredients we put in the soup otherwise it will poison us Okay, so we probably have time for one. Oh, uh, I'll pass it over to, to Shelly. Hi, I'm going to stay off screen because I've um, moved uh, to another place in my home and I am in sort of an awkward position. So um, I loved your talk, Elena. As you know, I love your work. Um, and... Um, you touched upon this on the at the end of your talk, but um, you discuss this at greater length in the chapter that you've written for the Bloomsbury Guide to Philosophy of Disability, and that is um, what you take from um, what you think uh, is um, useful and formative and insightful about Filipino philosophy. And I was wondering if you could just quickly summarize that for those um, people who are here today. Thank you. Thanks for the terrific talk. Thank you, Shelley. And I'll, I'll answer you and Rowena's question in the Q&A kind of as a twofer. So Rowena is asking, you know, how, how do I think that what do I think about the alternatives to individualistic autonomy? And that's kind of why I looked at Filipino philosophy, looking at concepts of lob and capua, which very crudely could be like the will and the being towards others. So lob would be this idea of the will and capua towards others and how um, a Filipino ethical system is built around how Loeb and Capua work with one another. But this idea that because of a confluence of indigenous thought, tribal thought, and the fact that the specific sequence of colonization in the Philippines meant that there was a delay in um, the push for Cartesian dualism. So basically until the Americans came in the 20th century with Protestantism. Um, there was a development of relationality and of agency that was not reckoning with individualization and individuality as the beacon of independence and agency. So what this means is that they were allowed to develop this idea of relational and collective understandings of power and agency where you ask yourselves if fundamentally I am codependent and relational how do I build agency from that as opposed to seeing relationality and effective ways of interacting with the world as something one must divest oneself from in order to purify oneself to become this autonomous um like atomistic individual because we have we live purely through rationality so because of the way that rationality is not lionized in the same way from the start it means that we can accept other ways of engaging with each other reality our inner lives that encompass what i call the pararational so these things that are empowering 
like certain affects and certain relationships of gratitude and debt towards other people that in the Western canon would be seen as something to be devalued or something that is not worthy of one living the rational life. So because there is not this idea that a specific version of reason is more important than everything else, we have a more fertile ecosystem going on. And about the limitations of liberal feminist autonomy. So I don't mean to be overly harsh because I have learned so much and there is a lot of excellent, excellent research done from feminist uh, relational theorists. However, I guess by no fault of their own, um, you know, people in the 90s and early 2000s are, were mostly white women that skewed liberal in their thinking. Um, and it means that by trying to define relational autonomy as the opposition to individualistic autonomy, they always have to reckon with that as their primary concept with which to dialogue with. And a lot of work has been done there and I'm not discounting that work, but where I see the limitations is that, okay, but you're still talking to that as if it's the only thing. It's kind of like a, a negative portrayal of like who we are if we're not this. Well, it's what interests me with Filipino philosophy is this idea of what if we just didn't feel the need to always look at this idea of rationality? What if we explore what it means to develop agency in another way? So it's basically, even when I say with Marxist feminists, like it's still within a very Western idea of having to deal with capital, having to deal with property as individualism, as property agency, as power of dominion. Um, and it's very refreshing to deal with a conceptual culture that is doesn't feel the need to always define itself as an opposition to that if that makes sense that's thank you very much that's a very comprehensive answer thank you all right it, it seems that we have come to the allotted time uh, i'd like to thank you again for your wonderful presentation and uh now now it's time to to pass it over to to melinda hall um thank you <laughs>